Great to be here. I, I feel a little bit lonely. <laughs> I feel like I should say a few words and then move to another seat and criticize it. Uh, it was great to be in Madison. Great to be in Wisconsin. Um, I guess one of the first things I want to say is that uh, a lot of the struggles that the labor movement's going through, uh, there's some partial victories, uh, and there's a lot of defeats. And one of the crucial questions is to really think about what do we learn from each of these struggles? Uh, and, and I think it's crucial in judging them to keep asking the question, what is being built in terms of a better positioning ourselves for the next struggle? I think that's really a strategic question all the time. Whatever the issue is, what are we actually building? Because whether we win on that issue or not, uh, most of what we face is going to change unless we're constantly building something and increasing the options that we have. So uh, I'm anxious in the discussion to hear from people about how they see what's been happening in Wisconsin, what happened in Wisconsin, in terms of the protests. Because from the outside, when the protests at the legislature here occurred, it was electrified. I mean, this wasn't just the Wisconsin thing. People were inspired all over the, you know, all over the world. Everyone knows the stories about people calling in from everywhere to send pizzas to the picket line. It was exciting to pass the pizza place yesterday. John Paul pointed it out to me. But, but it was just exciting everywhere. Everybody was, uh, you know, there were all kinds of students who hopped on an overnight bus and zipped down so they could see it directly. And uh, you, you, I, I think that Wisconsin dramatized some larger issues. Uh, one thing that it dramatized was that even though things seemed quiet, there really was. It revealed, it exposed the potential to actually do something. I think the, you know, the extent of that protest surprised people, and we should remember that. And it actually showed that uh, there is this potential to mobilize resistance. Uh, it also added to the question of inequality and what's happening to unions, the question of democracy, which I think is a, a crucial question, issue to build on. And it seemed from us watching this when we saw all these young people that, that a new generation was being introduced to the struggle, which is uh, absolutely critical. And then the question is, well, what happened? And one of the things that clearly happened is uh, uh, in spite of the size of the protest, it still wasn't, it still hadn't mobilized enough people. The, the, the protest still hadn't, be reached, hadn't reached the kind of scale that's necessary to defeat those with power. And that also it seemed that it wasn't deep enough, that even the people who were there uh, were there because of uh, certain sympathies and opposition to what was go going on, but it wasn't part of the kind of deep commitment that could really continue and move on to change things. And I think that in terms of what happened afterwards, it also showed the vulnerability that the labor movement is to being isolated. That the successes of the labor movement, in a sense, uh, were, con were contradictory. That if the labor movement is making success, but those success successes aren't universalized, it's vulnerable. it's vulnerable to being isolated, it's vulnerable to the, to the right using that. And the final thing I think it showed, again, I'm speaking from the outside, so I'm really interested in the comments people have. It showed the limits of putting your energy into electoral politics. Uh, electoral politics are important, but if, 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 if we're not really building a broad base, uh, we're going to lose it. You know, even if you elect sympathetic people, the kind of pressures that are on them, if we don't have an ability to have counter pressures, the electoral uh, ends up disillusioning people. And so the question is, how do we build the kind of base so that by the time you get to the electoral, it confirms your power. It confirms things that you've been fighting for rather than thinking, okay, now we're handing it over to somebody else and they'll lose it for us. It never happens that way. We've had social democratic governments in Canada time and again, and. Uh, it's turned people off to politics more than anything else I have to say. Uh, so I, I think, so, so what, what Wisconsin really showed, I think, was that it highlighted what is happening everywhere. That people are frustrated, 
they're angry, uh, but there's an inability in the labor movement to take advantage of that. There's a crisis in the labor movement everywhere. We have to be, we have to seriously think about that crisis. We can't just talk about how everyone is attacking us, and that's kind of the story. The real story is how come we can't respond, and that's what we have to really take seriously. And responding doesn't mean that we say we're going to wake up the next morning and we're going to try harder. It's actually having to think about trying differently. That's the critical question. So uh, let me just, I, I want to start with uh, some post-war history to put this in context. And I, and I want to draw, uh, divide history into three periods. What happened immediately after the war, what happened uh, in the, after the 60s, when labor seems to be at the height of its militancy, and what's come out of this latest crisis, which is the greatest crisis since, we, since the, the 30s. And I think they're different in, in important ways. And, and I want to preface this by saying one of the things we have to understand about the labor movement is that it comes out of the working class, but it's not a class organization. Unions are sectional organizations. They re represent specific groups of workers. And this becomes a problem. There are points in time when representing specific groups of workers means that you can make gains for them, and those gains can be spread, and the specific moments in time when being sectional uh, actually isolates you and becomes a problem. So uh, when you look at the post-war period, uh, I, and I should say, the, the, the point about the sectionalism is that in the 30s when unions were formed, there was a certain momentum, there was a certain culture, Having, forming the unions. There was a left that articulated a larger vision. Uh, unions had to be mobilized in the community. That's where they were organized. Uh, so unions had a sense of being more than just sectional. They had a sense of being linked to the class. And one of the crucial things to happen after the Second World War was to break them. To, uh, and and that, that involved two things. It involved defeating the left and left ideas and tactics. So, so after the war, it wasn't that the labor movement was defeated, but the left in the labor movement was marginalized and left ideas were marginalized. And uh, what I mean by that is, on the one hand, communists were kicked out of the labor movement, and in kicking communists out, it often meant you kicked out anybody who was a socialist or radical, even if they weren't communist. Um, the, and what the left was really pushing for was a unionism that was raising basic democratic questions. Who controls investment? How much democracy can you really have uh, in the workplace? Uh, a vision of society that was based on equality and universal, uh, and universal programs, a sense of security. Uh, there was a strategic vision that the left had about building capacities. And then there was also this question of solidarity across unions, and the Taft-Hartley Act broke that limited picketing to just uh, your own issue. And the other thing that was happening that I think that we underestimate is we think of the post-war period as this Keynesian period when everything was actually quite wonderful. And what we have to understand about the post-war period is that it was actually laying the foundation for globalization and a lot of the things we faced later. Except it was in the context of the trade union movement still having certain kinds of strength. But you know, we have to remember this is the period in which as I said earlier, the, the left is destroyed. Free trade, this is when free trade really begins to emerge in the 50s. Late By the late 50s, you've got multinational corporations growing like crazy, especially moving into Europe, taking advantage of the European market. Uh, finance, the birth of finance is in the 50s and 60s, as people are buying, getting mortgages, mortgages as you, you're getting the first uh, pensions that workers are negotiating. And you've got, uh, a culture emerging in terms of workers that's based on individual consumers. The message basically is leave the economy to the capitalists. They know what they're doing. Uh, you try to negotiate something after them. And your benefit will be uh, if you're selling your labor and you'll get something with the wages that you can build your own little nice space in terms of your own home and be an individual consumer. Uh, consumption is how we'll compensate you for selling your labor and letting us uh, control it. So you have this first stage where the left 
is dramatically weakened, if not destroyed. But the labor movement is still not destroyed. You've still got a, a labor movement that, in the context of rapid growth, has a lot of economic power. It's got some power still in the workplace, uh, and it's, it's able to negotiate essentially a private welfare state. Some countries it was more social, but in the U.S., it's essentially a private welfare state for negotiating their pensions and health care itself. Uh, and there's a lot of economic notes. Now, this creates the conditions for uh, the, second, the second year and the second show. What happens in the 60s into the 70s is that the militancy of workers becomes a problem for capital. That even though the left isn't there, and even though the demands aren't in the system, their militancy, their confidence in terms of relative uh, full employment, means that they're not accepting management authority in the workplace. They're resisting it. Uh, they have high expectations of what their wages should be, and they insist on them, even as the after the post-war boom, the economy slows down a bit, workers are still expecting in this class society that they're going to keep fighting for more equality. So you have a lot of militancy, and this, this is part of the crisis of the 70s. That for capital in the 70s, capital in the state, workers are becoming a problem. And it's part of a broader cultural upheaval. Environmental movement is emerging, there's a consumer uh, movement emerging, there's a whole youth rebellion, especially around uh, Vietnam. So it's part of a culture. Capital is freaking out, out about this, and neoliberalism emerges out of this period. We have to regain control, especially over the working class. Uh, and they stumble through it. They're not quite sure how to do it. They try different things. They limit imports. They try to stimulate the economy. Nothing works. And it's expressed through inflation. Workers are raising their demands, or keeping their demands high while productivity is slowing down. Corporations don't want to uh, <coughs> lose their profits, so they raise prices so they can keep their profits, and you get inflation. Uh, you get the threat of international competition and in the U.S. And there's this determination to break the working class, which eventually emerges by the end of the 70s. It takes almost a decade by letting unemployment rise. <coughs> so there are taxes, ideological attacks. They begin to attack the social programs through the 80s and 90s, so workers won't feel so secure. But the key was letting unemployment rise until inflation is broken. So that's the second stage. In the first stage, the left is broken, but there's still a lot of militancy. Now they have to break that militancy. And that's what neoliberalism is essentially about in the 80s and 90s. And they weaken the labor movement significantly. Um, and, you know, in terms of understanding why uh, labor was so vulnerable to this attack, it's some of the things that I've been trying to raise. Labor has made gains for itself that now aren't being universalized. First in the 50s, they spread. Now they're not spreading to anybody. Somebody sees labor making a gain, they begin to see this as, they resent it. This is just going to raise my prices. They look at labor having a private welfare state, well, they don't have that kind of health care or pensions. Uh, the kind of uh, skills and capacities that workers had in the 60s and 70s were militant, but they were very economic. They weren't the kind of political class skills to take on something like neoliberalism, where you have to really confront the state. Uh, you have a certain bureaucratization in the labor movement because if you're sectional and if you're just fighting for yourself, if there isn't a larger vision of what the union is about, soon the union becomes something that's instrumental. And by that I mean that the union becomes something that I support because it gets something from me. It becomes like an insurance policy. I pay my dues and this is what I expect. And as you begin to see the union move, to that kind of an organization, it's got a bias built in for bureaucratization as well. Let the staff and the leadership do these things. We'll be there when they really need to mobilize us for a strike, which can get turned on and turned off. Uh, and then neoliberalism reinforces all of this by, this is the point I was making yesterday, by getting people to internalize the essence of neoliberalism. People always will survive. If they don't find collective ways, if the collective ways stop working, they find individual ways of surviving. So they work overtime, kids stay at home longer, people look for 
tax decreases is a, effectively a wage increase. Uh, kids who are getting married try to save up for a mortgage by living at home longer. Uh, people look to their home as an asset, their house as an asset rather than a home. Hope that prices will rise. They look to their pensions rising. If the stock market rises. So you're beginning to have the working class itself, not just the leadership, but the you know, workers themselves. People who just criticize the leadership, I think, are misunderstanding how difficult it is because this is also something that's happening to the workers themselves. They're getting integrated into neoliberalism. And then you get this crisis. Now, in this crisis, you think that we should now be on the offensive. You know, capital has gotten everything at once. They said we have to break inflation. We need to have more inequality. We need to have reduced taxes. We need less social programs. We need to become more prepared. Everything that they wanted, they get. And then they don't deliver anything except the largest crisis since the 30s. They should be vulnerable. That's an important lesson to, to learn about this. They're not. The labor movement ends up on the defensive, defensive again. So we shouldn't think that these kind of crises automatically do anything unless we're organized to challenge it. And what, come, what emerges out of uh, this crisis is that the labor movement's actually not very really strong. It's actually not much of a threat. The question is, why are they doing this to the labor movement? And they're doing it this time, I think. We debated. I think they're doing it because they can. Why not? What are they going to do? You know, had you tried it in some other case, there might have been resistance. Uh, in Ontario, uh, 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 the Conservative Party, a right-wing Conservative Party, raised the question of introducing uh, right-to-work legislation. And the Labour movement actually, in spite of how weak it was, actually mobilized against it. And they dropped it. Because their feeling was, well, if we can get right-to-work legislation as a freebie, let's go for it. But if there's going to be resistance, and it kind of gets a little bit messy, it might not be worth it. And you know what basically has been happening in the United States is they decided that they can do it. And this is actually an opportunity to not just have a weaker labor movement, but actually lock something in place permanently. Now we're actually going over after the institutions. And you know, you see that most dramatically in Wisconsin. You, can, you know, you see it with them basically saying the public sector can't actually bargain, can have a union, as long as you can't get anything with them. And then uh, to take that further, you go to right to work. And then the question is, well, why would anybody pay dues if the legislation says they can't actually bargain, but you can pay dues? And uh, if you do bargain anything, you're not to get it. So uh, I, I think what's been going on is it's just been an attempt, uh, a recognition that you can permanently cripple the labor movement. It's not just a question of labor. And I think that's what's going on. So the question is, so what, what does this mean for us in terms of challenges? I think the first thing we have to say to ourselves is, uh, uh, Doug Fraser at the end of the 70s, president of the auto workers at the time, said that there's a class war going on, but only one class is fighting. And uh, there's an invitation to say the working class has got to get its shit together and engage in this war on behalf of workers. But what he was actually doing at the time was he was trying to threaten the Democratic Party that you're not taking this seriously and we're going to get more militant. And he didn't carry on that threat because the Democratic Party ignored him. He didn't feel like he had any choice. So that class rhetoric, it was dropped within months. But this is something we have to take seriously. The other side is engaged in class war. And they're engaged in it with enormous capacity. They've got the state. They've got their wealth. They've got the threats that they can carry out. And if, if the working class doesn't begin to see this in class terms, it will get killed. It will not have a chance of fighting this back. So, you know, when you look at the public sector, the notion of the public sector going on strike in one sector at a time when they're fighting the state, you can't win that battle. You just get picked off one by one. Uh, you know, you, you think about unionization. We talk about all the unionization that should happen in the retail sector and the fight for a $15 an hour wage, which is great, it should happen. But what people need is organization. They don't just need a, a living wage. They need some protection in the workplace. They need benefits. And you know, the question is, well, why can't people obviously are, want to get organized? You look at what's going on. There's an incredible uh, mood out there of wanting to fight back. 
yet they're not actually getting organized. Now, one of the problems is, and it's not globalization, you know, fast food chains aren't going to go and ship hamburgers to Madison. Part of the problem is that unions don't, won't work together to do this. Why wouldn't unions say, we're all going to get together and we're going to make sure that there's unions across the fast food sector in Madison, Wisconsin? And they don't say it because what they're worried about is their dues, and they're competing for dues, so they undermine each other. Somebody starts organizing, somebody bad mouths. And if you're serious, it would be difficult, but if you're serious about doing it, you would at least cooperate. And what cooperation would mean is you would see this about, as being about building your work. That you're a union, and that your ultimate long-term benefits come from building the working class, and if we have to invest in organizing workers and cooperate, whether we get to do or not, that's what you would do if you had a class perspective. And if you don't have a class perspective, you end up uh, losing. And you know, the same thing with like precarious workers. Or unionized workers can say, well, big deal, precarious work. That's them. That's unfortunate. But we're okay. <coughs> now you've got precarious workers in the auto industry itself. Now unions themselves are negotiating two tiers where part of the workforce is going to be two tier. And you know, as we were discussing earlier today, once you do that, when you talk about this question of what are the barriers to renewing unions and how do you renew them, if all the young workers coming in, the first thing that they see is they just sacrificed our standards to protect themselves. What kind of renewal are we going to have? Uh, I was just in <coughs> Oshawa, General Motors plant. And uh, the day before, we had had an event celebrating the victories for equal pay that women had in the mid-80s in Ontario. And then the next day, I'm speaking to auto workers who are demanding equal pay with the person working beside them. Uh, and, you know, that's what's happened over a few decades, and that's what we have to fight. Um, there is no way that the trade union movement can run around saying, look, what we win is good for everybody, and you should be supporting us, if it isn't concrete. If you aren't actually involved in the larger struggles and thinking about how your struggles impact on the rest of the uh, community. So if we're talking about the public sector, and it's, you know, it's the public sector that's mostly under attack right now because the, 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 the bulk of the trade union movement right now in terms of what's left standing. If they don't become the leaders in the fight for social services, they'll constantly be isolated because all they're doing is raising their taxes by demanding more, or that they're lowering the service because the government's got a fixed budget. They have to demonstrate that it's not the state that is protecting social services, it's workers. And it's those unions. And they have to take that on. Now, taking that on, most unions will agree. If you talk to them, they'll agree, and you'll see that they pass good resolutions, and they'll probably even put up a, a billboard saying, you know, we support the expansion of public services. Again, that doesn't convince anybody. And, and unions should know that. I mean, they should know what uh, matters or not. If you're serious about doing that, it means that you have to rethink everything about what the union is. You have to think about what do we put our resources into? What do we do? What is our research about? Uh, what does our staff do? Uh, are they dealing with some isolated group in some place? Or are they organizers and mobilizers? Uh, what do the locals do? Can we train people at the local level to do a lot of the things that happen locally so that we can move on to do the other things? And it means actually thinking about what's the relationship between this and bargaining? Because bargaining is what unions mostly do. And it, the sense of class and of the community doesn't show up in bargaining, it won't have any. So you actually have to risk saying, well, how can we take this on in bargaining in terms of what kind of issues we raise, what we make as priorities. If we're going to go in there and ask for a wage increase, it, it would actually make more sense to put on the agenda things that improve the quality of the service as a way of building a base in the community so that when you are defending your wages, your pensions, you've actually got a base to do it, rather than you're just going to have a militant statement, some posturing, and then you get killed. And then you have to deal with the fact that, okay, what if we have a strike? How do we deal with the contradiction between we represent an improvement of your services, but we're going on strike to cut them off? And that requires really thinking creatively about the power of workers to disrupt and how you can do it in a way that's actually consistent we're thinking about class. So let, let me give some examples. Uh, and these are examples that uh, intellectuals didn't actually dream up. 
workers confronted with real problems came up with these kinds of ideas. Uh, the government in Canada in the 90s uh, had told the Public Service Alliance, the, the people who administered the unemployment insurance scheme, plan, that they had to have a quota and cut off X number of people, uh, a certain percentage of the people that come there all the time. And the question is, well, what do they do about it? Well, that means that they're in a position of being seen as day police people who are unemployed and cut them off. What could be more devastating? What they did is they did a pamphlet that told everybody exactly how you should answer every question. So there was no legal basis whatsoever for cutting you off. And they got staff, because the workers distributing this would leave them vulnerable. They got staff, and in some cases they got other unions to stand outside the unemployment insurance offices to hand this out. It was signed by the Public Service Alliance Union, but it protected the workers from doing it. So people say, hey, they're on our side. These are people on our side. The, the posties were on strike, the post office, and they were, there's a lot of state mobilization against them because they had good contracts. Uh, they went on strike, and what they did is they continued to deliver pension checks and welfare checks. It was a statement that we're doing this reluctantly, and we know who's really being hurt by it, and continue to do it. The, the government uh, made that illegal, that they could do that, and they set up a warehouse that said that's the only place you can come and get your pension and welfare checks. And he actually thought that the posties would therefore pick at it. And everybody would get mad at them. What actually happened? The posties came down with lawn chairs and coffee and donuts and said, we'd love to bring you these checks at home, but they won't let us. So again, it, it positioned them as being, uh, you know, having a different relationship to them. Um, the, uh, Garbage, we raised this, we raised this with, gar with the garbage guys when they were on strike, but they didn't do it. We suggested they stop uh, picking up the gar garbage in rich neighborhoods and just pick it up in working class neighborhoods. And the garbage was all being deposited during the strike in one of the great parks in Toronto, which we thought was also the difference. Why don't you take the garbage and take it down to Bay Street, your equivalent of Wall Street? into the financial district, take it down into their party accounts, and make the connection so people can say, yeah, this strike has something to do with what finance is doing to you. So, you know, there's these creative things that can be done. One labor leader uh, was thinking about, what do I do with long-term care workers? The members don't want to strike against these older people and people with disabilities in long-term care. So he came up with the idea of, instead of having a strike, why not have a work in it? What we'll do is we'll take people from the second shift and we'll all come in. And we'll show the kind of service you could really provide if you were actually interested in the people. And then see what management does. What would they do? They take us out, in which case they're blocking the service, or do they let us in? And if they let us in, we'd have to actually organize the work ourselves and we'd show that we can organize it. We don't need these things. So, you know, and, and this became an internal fight in the end. A lot of people and the executive board didn't like this idea. It was actually easier to go on strike and have the state move you back to work. And then you just went and just throw up your hands and say, well, what could I do? I was about to uh, Instead of actually taking responsibility. It might also uh, create a whole new layer of leadership that might threaten. I mean, there's all kinds of things that come up, that have to come up when you uh, raise these things. The other contradiction of doing this, however, is, well, it's nice to talk about let's do something for the community, but you have to deal with the fact that your members, they're paying the dues, they actually expect to see some results. So the question is how do you deal with that? And, and part of this is actually educating our members that take a look at what's been happening to you over the last decades, and the more you continue to try to make these victories through this way, the more you're getting isolated and you're actually getting nothing or being more of that. This is actually a strategic thing to lay about. You have to put this in a long-term context, and if you do these things and show that you actually represent other workers in the community, you're actually positioning yourself. I think you can also begin to focus your demands on egalitarian demands within the union. If you have lower-paid workers, take them out. Say, this is the time where we're actually going to raise the wages of the lower-paid workers in our bargaining unit. That you'll get support. You can also take on the question of workload, which I think is the big unspoken issue in the workplaces. Uh, what is happening to people 
in the workplace in terms of pressures and speed up is horrific across the board. It's horrific in the private sector, it's horrific in the social sector, uh, because this is how they really are saving a lot. You can save a lot more by laying off 20% of the workforce than you can go in by asking for a 10% wage cut. And taking on the question of workload, I think can really mobilize people. Uh, I think it's about their life. I think it's about them just getting exhausted and tired out and thinking about whether they can take it. It's actually about jobs. <coughs> you, 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 you're, you're not going to have the cutbacks because uh, you're speeding up 80% uh, uh, of the workforce so you can lay off the other 20%. And it's about the community. It's about saying we can provide better quality services or better quality goods and therefore you can mobilize around. And uh, the other thing is unions just have to see that more of their life is going to have to be outside of poverty. That so much of what their conditions now depend on. If you look at the U.S. and you look at most working people, they're much more affected by whether they have a national health care system and by whether the social security system is going to be affected than what actually is happening in Barton right now when they don't have much strength. And people are beginning to catch on that they're also much more affected by the environment and their kids are going to be affected by the environment. So taking on those larger issues is actually part of defending yourself uh, and overcoming the isolation. The other thing, in addition to thinking about class, is how we think about class in terms of the actual role of members. Uh, we don't have the resources, even if we had all these great ideas, to match what the Koch brothers have. I mean, the only resource we ultimately have is mobilizing our members. So we have to start thinking about our members as potential organizers. We live in the community, we have links in the community, Jay McAlevey keeps emphasizing, you know, they go to church, at sports clubs. If you're mobilizing around larger issues, that's where you have to mobilize. The, the UAW is just organizing workers in Chattanooga. And you actually signed an agreement with Volkswagen that they wouldn't go door to door, which is completely mind-boggling. Because what it tells you is that they're trying to organize the company to accept them, that we're responsible and you can live with us, not the workers. And what did the right do? The right not the right wing workers in the plant, the right, an external right, mobilized door-to-door -door campaigns to talk to workers. Uh, you know, that can't work. We have to think of workers as organizers who have connections uh, in the community. And we have to respect workers uh, that they're agents. They have to start thinking that they can actually do things. We have to demonstrate that they can do things. Now, in saying that, we also have to recognize that the working class develops unevenly. There are people who have time, there are people who, don't, who have different levels of commitment to do things. So we do have to start with developing leaders. We have to seriously develop rank and file leaders who can be catalysts for mobilizing other workers. And democracy inside unions is critical to this. And we have to think of democracy not just whether we have a good constitution, but democracy is about whether we're actually getting people to be active, to participate. But that's what democracy is about. Is that people are getting the education, that they're developing the confidence, giving them the confidence to speak, uh, and that we, act, that we take seriously the notion of if we consider ourselves to be a democratic union, that everybody within the union is equal. And that means that we really take on issues of gender, and of race in a really active way. That isn't just a question of being kind of tolerant about it or having a good statement again. It's saying that if there is discrimination that prevents people from being equal members, we're going to take that on. Okay. Um, now, okay, so I mentioned we, have, we need a class perspective. Uh, we need to really think about how we're mobilizing our main resource. And we have to start developing an independent ideology. As long as our ideology is mainly, as long as the common sense in unions is capitalist common sense, the same common sense that capitalists have, guarantee that we're going to lose. You know, we have to develop an independent ideology. I just keep coming back to the notion that we're on the defensive at this point in time, after everything that they've done to us. You know, after all of this talk about, you know, get the state off the backs of capital, then you give them the bailout money. Uh, you know, that people aren't furious 
about the bankruptcy of the system and the rage and the anger is, is amazing. The vulnerability of capital at this time, when it's failed to deliver on what it promises, corporations are sitting there, they have this amazing ports of cash, and they're not investing it. And why wouldn't they say, that's a freebie, let's just tax it and invest it in useful things. Um, you know, the level of inequality is greater than it's ever been, democracy doesn't seem to be much, whoever gets elected, the argument is, well, these are the rules of globalization, and neoliberalism, and all you can do is this. Uh, you know, free trade is about their freedom to do what they want, and it limits our freedom to actually do things democratically. Uh, you know, the environment is raising all kinds of questions about whether the planet is going to survive because of the nature of the system that doesn't give a shit about the environment because it's just another commodity that contributes to growth. Uh, so this is a moment in which we have to actually exploit the fact and expose the fact that their ide ideology is bankrupt. The vision that they're putting forth doesn't mean much to us anymore and that we are going to put a different vision forward. And one of the points about this is, you know, people are always afraid, and this goes back to what happened uh, after, the end of the, uh, after the end of the Second World War, with the isolation of the left, that you can't be too radical or you're going to be isolated. And what we have to recognize is there's only one choice right now. And that's to be radical. That's the only thing that's practical. What's impractical is saying if we elect, you know, somebody else, the world will change. It isn't going to change unless unless we actually recognize that the problem that we face involves radical change. It actually means we have to start developing the kind of capacity that challenges banks as not democratic institutions that dominate our lives that does talk about corporate power and how undemocratic it is. How do you have a democratic society if some people have that much power over the rest of us? So that has to be taken. Another thing that has to be taken on, and it really struck me when I was watching the Wisconsin stuff on television, is the rhetoric of middle class. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, for one thing, the rhetoric of middle class is actually code for excluding poor blacks who weren't that involved in Wisconsin thing. Uh, and it's actually about alliance with a lot of people who don't have that much in common with workers. So I mean, somebody was defining the middle class as you know, people with anywhere from forty to two hundred thousand dollars income. And you know, so so what are you doing? You're excluding all kinds of things that are really about workers' lives if you're gonna align yourself with them. Whereas the fact that you might you know, where's the fact of unemployment insurance coming, where's the health care? So it's it's uh, it's very dangerous. And it also there's a notion to this middle class is that we're actually trying to buy in. We just want to kind of get into the system. We're not asking for much more. And it takes away from the fact that, you know, the whole idea, when people talked about the working class, they saw the workers as the potential bearers of a new society. But these were the agents who were actually going to challenge the system and talk about an alternative. And when you talk about the middle class, you're giving in. And, you know, in terms of bargaining, you're completely giving in. You're kind of admitting that we're not going to challenge you. We just want in. We just want you to be nice to us. And you know what should you know what unions should know better than anybody else is that's not a strategy. That's collective begging. That unions were formed because the under workers understood that that wasn't how you defend defend yourself. So let me just conclude with some comments on strategies. Uh, uh, and I've been emphasizing this in all my talks. Uh, I think the organizational question is the most important one we have to deal with. Ideology is important, we have to talk about vision and everything else, but we have to actually talk about how do we organize ourselves to take on these battles and to recognize that the organizations we have can't do it. You know, part of it is that uh, uh, unions as it's structured right now can't do it, but part of it is also that unions in themselves can't do it. And that people will not get engaged if they don't see that there are structures through which they can fight and it matters. Uh, people will come to a couple of meetings and then they'll go home and say, thank you very much, I've got other things to do. We have to show them that there are structures, you know, I don't mean that you don't have meetings. 
you know, people, if they know that there's a struggle going on. I always found when I was in the union, I was always writing documents that I would hope people would read and they would convert them to <laughs> Marxist, <laughs> socialist, or whatever. Uh, and, and what I discovered was that uh, normally it was, you know, there are a few people who are actually interested, they're, they're work for intellectuals, but normally it didn't have much impact. What mattered was when they were in a struggle, all of a sudden they wanted to read and learn from us. We had wage controls, I remember, in Canada. Wage, wages were imposed because our wages were starting to get higher in the United States and they were getting nervous about what this would mean in terms of competition. So the state imposed wage controls, and it was illegal to negotiate anything higher, and we decided that we were going to simply break the law everywhere. And we would threaten the company that if it didn't give us what we wanted, we would strike them. And what we were doing was we would have them put things on paper that said they were conforming, like that we gave up our lunch breaks, and that was putting us under the guidelines. But in fact, we would take them. So, uh, so on, on this question of wage controls, we decided to take it on and break the law. And I remember, and the president of the union would go to every community, all the stewards would be invited, the activists would be invited, and would give a speech on why we're doing this. And the stewards really wanted to know, we're going to break the law, how can we do that? Uh, and I was handing out his speech, and I had one left, and a worker came up to me and he said, I'd like, I want a copy. And I said, it's my last copy, I'll mail you one. And he grabbed it out of my hand and he said, I need a lot more than you. <laughs> and the point is, when you're in struggle, <laughs> these things matter. They want the information, they want the ammunition, because they have to go in and explain this to, to the rank and file. So they want them to know this. So, you know, so, so education is linked to struggle. Uh, the electoral, I just want to re return to. I'm not saying that elections aren't important. I'm not saying that there aren't times in which elections might actually be uh, very important. But what I am saying is the gap has been that we haven't built a social base. And when we get involved in elections, we start silencing ourselves. Because all we need to do is get this guy out of the room. And we stop doing the education. We stop doing the mobilizing. People see that after the, you know, after the election, that's it. Uh, elections have to come on top of there actually being a base that can be a check on who you elect, uh, and that can kind of confirm and consolidate what you want. We have to figure out how to deal with competitiveness. Workers are really overwhelmed by the argument that, well, you can't do that, that'll make you uncompetitive. And we can't say that's bullshit. No, the fact is it's capitalism, and if you're not competitive, it is a constraint that we live under. And yet public sector workers live under it too, because the argument is that we're not, private sector isn't growing. We're not going to be able to afford uh, whatever we do through the state. So, you know, it's, it's a longer question, which I don't want to uh, get into in any detail right now, but what we have to establish and get workers to understand is competitiveness is it's a real-world constraint that we can't ignore. But we have to constantly ask, how do we stretch that constraint so we can do more and eventually overcome that constraint? We don't want, we don't want a society where competitiveness dominates everything and nothing else matters. And that does mean that we have to take on things like challenging free trade, challenging the right of corporations to shut down something because they got some place better to go. We have to raise those questions. And we have to recognize in terms of internationalism, we can have all the talks we want about internationalism, but if American workers are making concessions, they're undermining everybody in the world. What internationalism actually means is we have to take on the battles here, and that has to create the space for others to take on the battles. And then you start ratcheting things. Um, you start using others as an example for why you can do things. That's a larger, uh, a larger discussion. We have to build a movement that can figure out all these. We, we have to be able to disrupt the system. I mean, if we can't disrupt the system, we can't. Uh, they won't take us seriously. We have to build the kind of a movement that can disrupt the system, and we have to think of more creative ways of doing this too that are effective. One of the things that we did in the mid-90s, uh, and I was telling Patrick about this yesterday, is uh, we had just had an election and the Social Democrats had actually attacked the public sector, and we stood in solidarity with the public sector, and they lost the next election and we got a right to win the government. And nobody could actually make the argument, well, let's just wait for four years and elect the Democrats that had attacked us before. So we had to actually do something. 
And we didn't have, a lot of our members had actually voted for the right wing. They were pissed off with the social democrats and didn't live up to their promises. So the question is, what do we do? And we didn't have the strength to do something like, the left is calling for a general strike. We couldn't call for a general strike. Our members are just, a lot of them have voted for a right wing government. So the strategy that we adopted was to have one day general strikes in one community at a time. And part of the reason for doing that is if you could do it in one community at a time, you could take all your best organizers and take them into that community and get a general strike there. The other thing was that uh, if you announced where you were going to have it, the media and the right would attack you. So it meant that the union actually had to put all its resources into those communities to fight that propaganda, but everybody was talking about it. You couldn't go into a coffee shop where people were discussing why we do this. And uh, this lasted two and a half years. So unlike the big protest, which comes and goes, this was a process of going from community to community and building. Uh, and we had, you know, the auto workers were on side, which meant we could shut down most of the manufacturing. The teachers were on side. The posties were on side. Uh, and the bus drivers were on side. So we could effectively have a general strike in each community. A lot of young workers got involved in this. We had cross picketing because if you struck, if it was illegal for you to walk out, and it was illegal for you to picket your own plant. So what we would do is get other unions to picket your plant. The posties would picket our assembly plant, and then workers would say, oh, "I can't go to the union. I want to fight those guys." Or we get retirees to picket a plant. Who's going to cross a picket line with retirees? And then we would, you know. So, you know, so there's a lot of strategy that, the point is it built solidarity, it got people discussing things. Uh, the first event we had was in London, Ontario, and it was the coldest day in history. And we were wearing baklavas because it was so cold, which, which meant that people couldn't identify you. So I was actually going around on the picket line and asking people why they were out. Because at that point in time, the first thing they did was they cut welfare by 27%. And they were going to move on to attack the units. But the first thing they did was, and the first demonstration we had was all they had done was attack people on welfare. So I was asking people why you're up there. And the answer I was getting from people who didn't know who I was because of this mask was, we don't want the kind of community where people are starting. And, you know, that wasn't what somebody expected. The first place we actually went to to have a discussion on this was the uh, uh, Ford Assembly plant in a small community called St. Thomas. And the staff person was afraid to go in there. So they're going to kill me. They're going to lose a day's pay or the fact that they're coming well there. I don't want to go in there. And he went in there. And when he started, he was happy. And as he began to make the case, people began to listen. And he was making the case, you know, you're next and broadening what's going to happen. And, you know, we got it. Not only did we get a pretty unanimous vote from people, they were the first people who ended up calling us and saying, what's the next day? It just, you know, it was a strategy. And we didn't win in the end. We might have slowed them down a bit. We didn't come close to winning. The point is it was a process of building. And one of the problems was we didn't know where to take it. You know, you, you try to escalate it. We weren't able to get more unions involved in the end. Unions like steel and retail didn't join. Part of our strategy was it had to become strong and maintain that momentum. Uh, we had a great, you know, the event in Toronto, 200,000 people came out. Uh, businessmen who couldn't get to Wall Street were wearing baseball caps so they would look a little bit like workers and could maybe get to work, but it was shut down anyways. Uh, so it was successful if you judge things in terms of were you building, were you doing education, were you giving people a sense that there's other ways of doing things, were you making links, were you showing the community that you're actually the leaders, not the people that they're trying to blame for it. Okay, so all of these things take time. And we really have to respect the fact that if we're going to do this, it really means thinking very hard about well, what other kind of organizations do we need. We had formed something called the Toronto Workers' Assembly. Uh, and actually came from Bill Fletcher, American. Uh, he'd come up with this idea that at, at, a, at a conference we had uh, about why don't we organize the working class in their life outside the workplace. Locals can come as well, but why don't we organize them outside the workplace and form these assemblies? Pressed me. We went back to Toronto. We actually formed one. No one actually formed one in the States, which 
broadly labor, we formed one. Uh, it lasted for a while, it got into troubles, it got into the usual kinds of problems on the left in terms of splits. It got into problems because there weren't a lot of struggles. So it was hard to actually recruit the workers to it. It got into trouble because we've lost so much of our organization. I mean, you know, if you, if you, if you haven't been involved in organizing for three decades, you don't know how to do this. You don't know what to do at a meeting. Uh, you don't know, you know, and that was a real problem. But, you know, I, I think, but one of the things that struck me when I saw Wisconsin was, hey, this is where it should have happened. Wouldn't it have been great in Wisconsin to have a workers' assembly? And then as this thing began to fade away, whatever else your strategy was about recall, which is another question, there would have been a space where people could get together and say, well, what do we do next? How do we keep building now that we've seen this amazing thing? What, what, what structures do we want to create for young people so that they continue? Because they, you know, they got excited by this. What structures you know, can we create so we don't just wait to see what's the leadership going to do? And whatever they do, that's the answer. Well, we can actually put some pressure on them, show them with some momentum. So I think you know, that's something that's worth thinking about, these kinds of regional assemblies uh, that are a space for doing that. Uh, eventually, we have to think about our own parties, labor parties, socialist parties. Uh, and, and there's two reasons for it, which is kind of what I want to end with. Uh, one is that I'm convinced that unions aren't going to get renewed just under their own steam. Because, you know, there's an inertia there, there's a leadership that's overwhelmed, and, you know, they're struggling with so much just to keep things going. Uh, they're not thinking about larger things. Some of them are thinking about larger things, and that makes them uncomfortable. They, they actually are getting comfortable with lowering expectations. Nobody expects anything of us. We just blame globalization or neoliberalism. The rank and file just doesn't have the time. It's fragmented. It's busy in its own workplace. Uh, you know, both both adults are working. Unlike in the past, we run it off to a white and you know, we give you time. Uh, so you need an organization that is thinking about how you build working class capacity. So I'm not talking about a party whose head is into how do we, you know, stop talking about all kinds of things that will be elected and love, but a party that's actually saying. How do we support the people who are trying to fight at the base? How do we give them some resources so you, know, you, know, you, you have somebody raising something from the floor and the leader stands up and says, that's not true, I'm the leader, I know, I've got contact with the companies, and everybody believes it. You actually have some alternative analysis and resources so you can challenge this. So somebody actually can make links across workplaces. Even workers that are fighting in different places, they're isolated from each other. That's the kind of an organization we need when I talk about a party that actually gives people resources, brings a larger vision, does education, which requires a lot of organizing to do education. You don't just come in there and say, I know everything and this is how it works. You have to see what works, what do people get, what don't they understand, how do you, how do you relate to their experiences. So one point about a party is it, it's the only way I think that we will actually be able to be doing it. That's one point. Uh, and the second question is, even if you have good unions, unions can't transform society. They're still unions. It's critical that we have the kind of a party that brings a class sensibility into unions. And what I mean by that is unions aren't going to be class organizations because there's a group of workers that pay their dues, and it's democratic, and democracy is going to mean that they're going to be trying to represent those people. But what the left can do is fight for injecting a class sensibility. So you bring in class ideas when you're thinking about your strategy in bargaining, how we don't get isolated, when you're thinking about your strategy in, in organizing. Uh, so you're always bringing a class perspective and a larger perspective on the world. And, uh, you know, and eventually you're going to have to get involved in electoral politics, but from a different perspective, from the perspective that electoral politics is part of a stage in transforming society. But what we really want, what we mean by democracy, is actually electing a government that's going to enable us, that's actually going to use all the capacities that states have to say, you know, if you're taking over factories, we're going to actually support you in terms of markets, in terms of resources, in terms of education, in terms of finance. If you're struggling, we're going to use the resources of the state to support that. That's what real democracy would mean, not just votes. 
And these are really big questions, and they haven't been on the agenda for a long time. So, you know, my appeal is to think about them. You know, they're just not going to happen immediately. They're intimidating. But if we don't think about those things, we're just on a treadmill. And the, the biggest lesson of the last 30 years is don't think we just got hit with the worst thing in the world. <laughs> You're going to discover that there are worse things. You know, when workers made concessions, they always thought, well, we'll give it to them this time, and that's it. And all it was was an invitation to, well, why don't you come back? This is terrific. Go in there and ask them for more. And any company that didn't do that was stupid. So we, we just have to recognize that even to be defensive, I mean, one of the problems with unions now is they're not even good defensive organizations. We used to criticize unions because they weren't socialist organizations. They're not even defensive organizations. <coughs> So to do that, I think, you know, the real point is there, we have to get much more radical just to be defensive, and we have to get a larger vision on the table to survive, and we have to think about well, what kind of structures and organizations do we need. You know, just a final thing. In the 30s, you know, you know, we should compare the 30s to today. In the 30s, we had craft unions that didn't want to organize the unskilled. Like they, could. they didn't even want to organize them. Uh, they were becoming bureaucratic, uh, and they were becoming ineffective. And what happens in the middle of the depression, 25% unemployment, you begin to see the formation of industrial units. A new kind of working class institution. There have been models of it before, but now it really explodes, where people say, we've got to organize people across race, gender, and skill. We need new tactics. If we can't strike in the depression, we're going to sit in. And you know, once people sit in one place, it spreads. People get get it. You know, we need a new democratic structure. They, elect, they begin to elect shop stewards, so that a shop steward can go and talk to the boss, and he can't be fired instead of a worker who's vulnerable. So they began to think through what is democracy, what is strategy, what is organization, and the depressing thing about this moment in time is that that kind of discussion needs to take place today. How do we have to change our organizations? What kind of new organizations do we need? What kind of new tactics and strategies? What kind of relationships do the rest of the labor movement? How do we think about workers as not just people who are in a workplace, but they live in the community in every way? What's happening with the environment? How do we pull that together now and, and, and think through the strategy? Thanks. Now I'm going to ask questions. Um, when people raise questions, which I really welcome, I, I also, I, I really I am interested in how you feel about what's been happening. Uh, so don't hesitate to make a comment before a question. Okay. Can you give your definition of working class? Because I think that one of our problems is we exclude too many people in that. And that may be part of the nature, the whole structure that the United States or whatever lives under. But well, how do you define it? Can I take a couple of questions? Sure. So I don't end up doing yeah. all the talking. Okay. Go ahead. Here. Well, this is the same question I asked Bill Fletcher when he came to me. I agree with everyone. The question is who's going to do it? Because, uh, you know, who's going to provide that sort of militant uh, class conscious leadership to the trade union? What we've got now, we, we have a leadership that, uh, uh, that when Act 10 came along, uh, they channeled everything back into the Democratic Party. Uh, they announced that without consulting the members that we give up uh, uh, benefits, uh, and then they did the recall, lost that. Uh, bet everything on Mary Burke, lost that. And when, it, when the uh, work came along, they had nothing left. It was pretty much just, uh, you know, somebody said it was like the deer in the headlights. Uh, so, you know, we knew who did it last time around. Like you, they, I mean, they, were, they were going into the Depression, there were 30,000 members of the Communist Party in the United States, and half of them were in the trade unions. And there were other small groups that were heavily uh, invested in uh, organizing workers. Uh, those, those organizations don't exist today. And to the extent that they're even around, they, you know, ignore the organized working class. I mean, they, you know, they, they work on campus, or they, uh, you know, think that the unions are, uh, instruments of uh, capitalist rule or something like that. 
So, and there are also a handful of leftists that are active in the, in the labor movement here in town, uh, retired, retired leftist, leftism, leftism, uh, seem to make a piece with, uh, with the uh, labor bureaucracy. So, so who's going to do it? I mean, we have a conservative leadership that and provide effective leadership now. But who's going to who's going to uh, provide that uh, military leadership? And don't just say I'm, I'm waiting for an are. easy question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. One more question, then I'll try to answer. Anybody else? Okay. Just um, as as a you know staffer, I just some of giving practical advice on pushing change within within the labor bureaucracy. Okay. So I thought maybe you guys would pass on some answers to me. Um, well, I'm really struggling with all these things, and I think that they're the things we have to struggle with. And I wouldn't get down on the fact of how hard it is. I mean, this is what this moment in history represents for young people. You know, if you look at the history of the labor movement, going back to the Communist Manifesto in 1850, people always thought there was an answer that they had in front of them. You know, either that there's going to be a revolution, or that uh, there's going to be you know, unions will be built, and unions will uh, have that power, or that it's going to be communist parties, or it's going to be social democratic parties. And then this generation of young people is actually living through a period when nothing gives them confidence anymore. They don't believe in the unions. The unions have been stuck. Social democracy has generally been exposed. It's just trying to administer capitalism slightly differently. Communism has uh, been defeated. So people have to cope with the fact that you can't just stand up and say, well, who do I join? Just tell me, tell me where to go so I can just join. People actually have to invent something new, and that's incredibly difficult. Uh, so, so let me try to, I wouldn't say answer some of these things, but comment. The, the question of who's, who's the class. Uh, you know, there, there are a lot of Marxists, and this, this was a tendency in the Communist Party to defend the class in terms of the industrial proletariat. Basically, meant factory workers, construction workers. And I, I think that was a really serious mistake. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I think that the class is everybody who actually has to uh, work for a living, who doesn't exactly. have capital. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, you know, that's who the class is. Now, within that class, you can have all kinds of differences. And you can have people who, uh, you, you, you know, you can talk to teachers who see themselves. I've been spending the last while working with teachers. And, you know, you've got teachers who see themselves as professionals and look down at the caretakers. Uh, but we've actually been able to get them to come to meetings together now and have discussions about what's happening to the working class. And it's quite surprising how you can't tell when they're actually sitting in a room together if they're not dressed differently about what their take is. I mean, a lot of teachers are starting to feel proletarianized. They're starting to feel like I have no control over my classroom. I'm more insecure. Uh, I'm being treated like shit. I mean, all this talk about professionalism. So, you know, it's, it's a dynamic thing. I mean, people who themselves never thought of the working class begin to wonder about it. Uh, and maybe for a while I actually say I'm professional because I don't, you know, it's not good to be working class. So you have to fight, fight about it. But yeah, I, I think it's crucial to have that kind of a broad sense. I think it's stupid not to be analytically done and strategically done. So uh, that, uh, who's, oh, by the way, in terms of the point made about the communists, that uh, most of them were in, they, they were actually in two places. A lot of them were in the workplaces. But in Canada, almost half the Communist Party was actually with the unemployed workers. Because in, in, in the 30s, that was so fundamental to organizing. Because that you know they were being put in boot camps, uh, and that's where a lot of the protest was. But that's also a lot of the people who ended up in the workplaces and became great organizers. So organizing the unemployed then was critical to actually getting into the uh, into the working class. Um, I mean, who's going to do it is the big question. You know, it's, it's, there's nobody out there who's going to do it. You know, either we decide that there's people like the people who come to meetings like this and want to talk about this, are going to do it, or, or we're fucked. <laughs> but, but, but no, I mean, that's the only, you know, that's the only answer. Of course, we have to go out there and, you know, reach other people. Who, you know, there's tens of thousands of people wondering the same things out there.
who look at what's going on here and are frustrated, who know that there's some, this can't be the end of civilization, what we got today. This cannot be the ultimate and what human beings can achieve. The problem is that that's our defeat. What the defeat over the last 30 years is about is fatalism. The notion that it can't be dead. It's not about, you know, we were talking about this earlier too, about, uh, you know, when I was growing up, you know, the thing about the working class was you had to buy them off. They were militant, you, you know, you gave them something to buy them off. Uh, and we used to, we used to learn that this question of the working class is being bought off, that's how they're being integrated. They don't have to buy off anybody right now. You know, you don't like it, what are you going to do about it? Nothing? Okay, good. That's the end of the story. We have, you know, there's a lot of people who resist, and the problem with a lot of struggles is the resistance. They resist, but it doesn't go anywhere. You know, the question is, you know, we had our days of action. Great event, two and a half years, mobilized probably a million people through the course of it. There was no left to take advantage of this. When we left a community, what we did in each community is we, we had somebody from the movements and somebody from the unions co-chaired uh, the structure. And then we worked you know, three or four months to, to get a massive show of force out. And then we moved to the next community. Well, this was an opportunity to say, now that we built this, what's going to happen? Why don't we actually go door to door and find out what people need? Find out what capacities they have, find out whether they'd be in the workforce if they had decent child care, and then say, we want a plan to put this together. You know, that time the issue was jobs. Uh, the left didn't do that. Instead, the left was talking about, why don't we have a general strike? That wasn't the problem. The problem was, we had all kinds of young workers who suddenly got excited about doing something. And we didn't have anywhere to put them. Nobody was saying, you know, we have a, an organization that isn't crazy in terms of what you were raising, that you should join. Learn some history. Find out how they did it before, and then start thinking about how we'll do it in the future. Excite people. Well, that wasn't happening. That was a fault of the left. So part of this crisis, which I think, in my mind, is actually at least as important as the crisis in labor, if not more so, is the crisis in the left. We don't have a left that can take on this project. And that's what has to be built. And there's nothing, I can't think of anything magical about doing this. It actually, you know, requires what always happened. You mentioned the Communist Party. In Canada, the Communist Party started with 27 people be meeting in a barn. Uh, you know, so you, you, know, you, you do an analysis of the situation, you do an analysis of the issues, you get some people together to develop a strategy, you start exciting young people, uh, and you have to build. And that's the only way that can do this. Uh, the, the question of staff, it's, it's an interesting question. You know, what does somebody who's actually hired by you do if they want to challenge the unit? Um, you know, I got hired on staff, and uh, it was a unique time. There was actually an enormous amount of space, for me, which I don't think there is right now, uh, to do things. Uh, I don't think you can do things alone. I don't think it's a question of you standing up and being a hero. Uh, I, th I think it's a question of you actually meeting other staff, developing relationships with locals, uh, you know, being reasonably careful, but developing some kind of a base, supporting these kinds of discussions going. And you know, you know, one of the problems in terms of the leadership isn't just that the leadership, you know, that they're bad guys. There's no pressure on them, and it's actually easier to just fall into you know a bureaucratic structure. Uh, it matters if there's pressure. And where there's pressure, there still are, you know, depending on the union, there are people who, if there is pressure, you know, the best aspects of being part of the working class start coming out again. They start feeling like, yeah, well, maybe we can do something rather than I don't believe it. You know, there are trade union leaders who feel like, I'd like to do something, but the members aren't there. It has to be shown that you can do those things. So I, I think you have to be, you know, meeting with others so you're not doing it alone. One thing I think is really important is that you develop relationships with people outside the labor movement. People on the left, people who will challenge you and say, why don't you do this? And you say, I can't, I'll get fired if I think you have that discussion. I found that incredibly important to myself. My closest friends were always challenging me. Uh, and that was very important. It was important to be a check on myself. Uh, find decent things to read. Bug academics to give you something good to read. 
on analyzing things so you can pass it around. Ask people to set up reading clubs so they just start reading this thing. Drop in when you can. I mean, you know, we all got to figure this out. There is no, there's nothing that's sitting on a shelf and somebody will say, well, here's the answer. We're just living through this really difficult moment, but we've got to do something. Questions? Go ahead. Um, we're, we're both actually uh, graduate students, so we're from the Graduate Studio Union here at UW Madison. Yeah. Um, so I'd like you to talk for a few minutes or if you have any reflections on the state of higher ed, um, higher education in the U.S. One question would be what are the lessons that we can learn from, for example, Quebec students who did an amazing job um, just a few years ago uh, fighting back tuition increases and such. And then secondly, what do you think about um, academia as becoming more and more of a spot that reflects the rest of the problems in society? So a gentrification of labor, you know, more and more contingent labor, even for academic workers, faculty, yeah. uh, and staff, and uh, the way in the world, more and more the, the capitalist um, common sense, as you put it, uh, has seeped into higher ed. Well, it sounds like everything that is happening uh, in Canada and elsewhere. So, you know, higher ed is being neoliberalized. Uh, and it's, again, it's not surprising. There's not going to be these highlands where it doesn't happen. So, uh, I'll speak to the Canadian experience and get back to the Quebec issue. Uh, yes, I mean, in general, most of the education at universities in Canada is now happening uh, either through uh, contract faculty or paid less than half of with uh, Prosket, or through TAs. And the TAs, they're kind of transitional. So you might think of like, well, uh, what happens to them afterwards becomes a more important question. But still, they're doing a lot of the teaching. And they're working for a long time. Yeah, and a lot of them end up to be there, like, yeah, for seven, seven years. So the TA thing is also very important because they're doing a lot of the work. Uh, uh, and then the content of education, you know, the faculties that are growing are business and the professional faculties, and the faculties that are disappearing are social sciences, environmental studies, and part of that is because they're less important in terms of raising funds, but now part of the reason is also is that's where the radicals come from, so when you have student strikes, that's who's leading them, and so it's also a way of easing that out, and then you've got the question of uh, debt which again is a disciplining mechanism. It means that when you decide what you're going to do, you have to say, well, I've got all this debt, I have to actually get a job that is going to give me a decent income, and if I have to compromise to do that, I'm going to fall in line. You're getting the kind of discipline that workers have. So all those things are happening in the university, and inevitably, as I mean, I wasn't sure this was going to happen, but I, I arrived in Wisconsin, I find that my tenure is being challenged. So it isn't as if profs are going to be immune from this if they're the only ones. So, those things are the same. So, so what do you do about it? Um, what is so terrific about the Quebec students is a few things. One is they actually began this fight uh, quite a while ago. They've been organizing, you know, some of them for seven years. So the, you know, one of the big lessons of the Quebec thing was these things don't just explode. Ex explode. It was real organizing. And it was organizing uh, in a hard way. It wasn't, you know, go talk to the social science guys because most of them would support us. They actually went into, you know, Quebec it meant, you know, they went to McGill, which is where the elite goes. And, you know, they got somebody off, but the point is they thought, you know, they're organizers. They're going to come and talk to everybody. And that's one question. You know, I know at the York strike, nobody was very interested in talking to engineering school, or nursing school, or business school, law school is a little differently, but eventually, well, if that's what the university is going to become, you have to figure this out and figure out what their issues are. So one thing is that they really worked, and then they, they really did it, you know, quite a time so they formed cells of people who organized everybody, you know, by department and every department. So there was this massive organizing, that was one thing, over a long period of time. And a lot of the people who started this organizing and left uh, could kind of go back and visit Quebec and see all this happening, because they actually lost the first time. So, you know, there was a continuity. Really, real organizing meant that you might see the fruits of it later. It wasn't always obvious. 
The second thing they did is they really were conscious of what issue are they striking on. So, you know, they, they struck for free tuition. They refused to do anything like, they considered freezing tuition a conservative demand. What they were really saying is uh, universities shouldn't be commodities. It should be accessible, and it's just how we think of this as a right. <coughs> Same way that you, you, know, you walk down the street, sidewalk, nobody charges you the sidewalk so far. But, you know, they really emphasized that, and they linked this to uh, the broader question of content in education. Why are we educating people at all? And they really spoke to this. I mean, all those things were terrific, and they were articulate. You know, they were organized not just in terms of other people. They were articulate in getting the message out. And they got an incredible response. I mean, when they, they, they had demonstrations every day. And when they went through neighborhoods, people were, out, were hanging outside of balconies with their pots and pans, yeah. cheering for them. So this became, you know, as, as the discussion earlier today was, when you reach that moment when you're not just an isolated militant minority, you know, it felt like everyone's on their side. Uh, you know, mothers were, you know, you just saw them bringing their kids up to the river to see this, and then their kids bagging the pots and pans. So it was exciting, and they took it through the province. It wasn't just in Montreal. So they would get this into other communities. And I think to some extent, it, it allowed people who were frustrated or were other things to support this. You know, I'm pissed off at something else, but hey, these people are fighting for something. So all of that was powerful. One of the limits in Quebec was the labor movement. To win this fight, they ultimately needed the labor movement to get outside. Had the labor movement actually gotten outside and said something like, we're going to have a one-day shutdown in support, and then maybe later we'll do more. That would have made a critical difference. Uh, that didn't happen. So that's part of the reason for why the labor movement, it's fundamental to sustaining it. Even if the spark is someplace else, you have to get to the labor movement. And the other problem, you know, for a while, has actually been electorally. This thing ended. People got involved electorally. That kind of took the steam out of things. But now it's wrapping, you know, it's going up again because the people people who got elected, of course, didn't live up to their promises. So people were elected. And in Quebec, there's also a, a left party called Quebec Solidaire that emerged out of the slogan, uh, you know, the ballot and the street. Uh, and it remains to be seen how that will emerge, whether it will also get co-opted electorally or whether it will actually be. So far, I'm a little skeptical about it. But, uh, so right now, there's a lot of demonstrations. Now the demonstrations actually started with uh, public sector unions fighting austerity. So now there's actually something going on that students can actually uh, catch on to as well. And it's been spreading to the high schools, you know, the technical schools. So, shoes. I think that a part of what makes it more successful in Quebec is that students actually do present a larger vision about what is the purpose of education in society. It isn't about how can I afford to pay the student debt forever and then. It really is engaging to everyone. People with their little kids are thinking, yeah, what is my kick? Like it actually <coughs> generalizes a vision. So it's not just specific to each individual, you know, little senators, students, or workers, and industrial, whatever. You think about how the world should be and actually have like a specific command and a vision that people can engage with, just an alternative instead of the usual, we can't afford anything. Oh, I think that's absolutely right. And then, and then the next stage of it is, again, it has to be organized in a way that this is sustained. So you don't have this great event, and it's wonderful, and a new generation of students comes and feels, well, they didn't change the world, so that's the point. So it is a question of what's going to happen to these students who got radicalized. Are they going to become socialists or actually challenge capitalism? <coughs> say, well, you, know, you, you can't just change the university. I mean, that's one of the things that you want. You can't change the university. If everything else is going in that direction, it's not going to happen. Uh, you might slow it down, you might win some concessions, but you're not going to transform, you know, you're not going to have universities that teach people how to be uh, the kind of citizens that control their lives on a daily basis and challenge the boss and challenge the state. Uh, so, so Quebec is exciting, but it's still, there's still this question about uh, 
how does this get sustained and how do these people move into a larger movement? How do they become the people that you just asked about? And that's who's going to do it. And I should say in defense of retirees, of which I am. Uh, one, of, one of the things that's happened is that there's a lot of retirees who still have a lot to offer. Uh, there's a real resource for retirees. They actually have time if they're union retirees because they probably have still have a decent pension, hopefully. So, you know, retirees are actually, uh, you know, a, a potential resource. You know, you know having retirees pick up plants is a very effective thing. Uh, and you know, a lot of unions that you look at, in, in, in auto, there's five times as many retirees as actors. <laughs> so when you think about resources, you know, that is something to think about. Unfortunately, how retirees have usually been used by unions, like in the auto workers, uh, retirees can't run for office inside the plant. But I can vote for anybody inside the plant, but they can vote for the presidents of unions. So unions would bus in retirees to make sure nobody ever defeats them. Uh, so, you know, the retirees are used as a, yeah. I mean, the point about any structures and any potentials is they can be used for the right of the life. But that's why organizing matters. Okay. Uh, last question. Go ahead. No last question. Uh, not so sure. Um, you know, all we've been talking about, we know, is not simply an American Yes. Um, and and I, I, sorry, I, I'm really happy you raised this because I think it's so important to know, you know, when I'm saying this is happening, it is happening everywhere. Nobody should have any illusions about, well, Europe's way ahead of us. Or it is happening, you know, we're in this particular crisis that is structural and the left has been defeated, and we're trying to figure out how to get out of it. So, you know, today's raising is so important. Go ahead. Well, um, you know, Western Europe, uh, unions are doing better than they are here. Canada, they're doing better than they are here. England is a basket case, and it's almost entirely disappeared. Um, and what does that mean in terms of developing the vision and organizing that you were talking about? You know, what does it mean that it is happening everywhere, or that it's happening uneven? What, what do you mean? Well, forget forget that it's uneven. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, okay. Let me try to answer that. I don't know if this answers your question. Um, uh, it is happening everywhere to a different degree. And people are struggling to find ways of doing things differently. So one of the potentials is to actually watch what others come up with, the kind of experiments, and see if they're working. And what we can do. You know, in Syriza, people rebel. Whether they're going to be able to sustain it or not, We'll have to see. It's going to be very hard to do unless they actually get some support from the rest of Europe. The rest of Europe. Uh, so I think we have to look at all those things and just sober them. Uh, instead of just kind of saying they screwed up or they screwed up, actually say, well, what did we learn from it? How, how did Syriza even get to the point that it got? For example, in the case of Syriza, one of the very important things that happened was uh, about five years ago, there were massive riots of young immigrant workers in the suburbs of uh, Athens. And uh, yeah. most parties completely disassociated themselves from it because they saw this as this awareness left over, uh, including the communists who condemned them for being uh, anarchist. And what Theresa said was, uh, it's not that we support the tactic, we think that we should be out there uh, burning cars. But we really do understand the frustrations they're going through and what their lives are like. And in, to that extent, they stood in solidarity with them. And it actually affected the movements, all the movements. They actually looked at this party that was saying these kinds of things differently. And, you know, just part of them developing a base and establishing the credibility and actually educating the rest of the, the rest of the Greek population. But there's a real problem here that we have to take seriously rather than find an easy way of writing it off. Uh, so I think we have to look at uh, a lot of experiments. In, um, in England, UNITE uh, has a, an organizing strategy where they're organizing uh, workers into the union even if they don't have a bargaining unit. They're forming locals of people uh, who want to fight over something, uh, who will pay some token dues, but they're actually are training staff to work with them, sending staff in, letting them establish their own local, 
and then fighting over things like a living wage. But now it's an organized fight within a union. Uh, and they don't know if it'll be successful, but they're actually putting enormous resources into it. And so far, it's, it's actually been quite successful. You know, that's an experiment that you can look at and say, well, could we do something like that here? Uh, what mistakes are they making? Um, and, you know, and there's a number of electoral things that are emerging in terms of political parties to watch. What are they actually doing? How are they doing it differently? Uh, there's the environmental movement, which is much stronger in Europe. Uh, and ask the question of, well, is it important to be involved in the environmental movement? Is that the way to actually reach young people? There's an irony in this country that somebody just wrote a paper. It's a former student of mine, which I don't know if it's right, but it's an interesting argument. His argument is that um, uh, the question of carbon taxes and of carbon trading was actually a neoliberal sure. way of dealing with the environment. Mm -hmm. You deal with it through the market, uh, rather than dealing with structural things and telling corporations what they can do and what they can't do. And yet, uh, this was never implemented, actually, in the United States, Australia, and Canada. And his argument for why this wasn't actually implemented, even though it's a perfectly neoliberal idea, was partly that uh, you've got, in these countries, strong people in the resource sector, strong social forces in the resource sector, mining, oil, tar sands, whatever. But the other reason for it was that the working class has been so hammered in those three countries, in particular, that workers see an increased tax, like a carbon tax, as an increase. They've been hammered already, and now there's an additional tax on everything, because if you're going to have a carbon tax, it's going to be a tax on everything. So they're actually in an informal alliance with the oil companies against a carbon tax. So even under neoliberalism, working people have been hit so hard that there's not even a base for, for doing it through the market. So you know, I, I think we have, that's one thing I want to say. We, you know, we, we have to take a look at what's happening, and there's good things happening in isolated ways. <coughs> what can we learn from it? You know, with the caveat that nothing great is happening anywhere. You know, people in the states think that this is the worst, and it's, it may be the worst, but that's you know, I'm, you know, not saying much. The, the other thing I really want to emphasize about it is that we all have to come to grips with our own state. You know, we can talk about internationalism, but the main barrier we have to fight that's really affecting, you know, labor law, uh, social programs, what unions can do, the nature of democracy, excluding people from democracy, is the state. And so we have to develop a way of challenging and eventually transforming our own state. And when we do that, we create space for others to serve. This is the critical thing. If we're really fighting here, winning things on the environment it makes it easier for people to fight elsewhere. And if we're giving up things here, we really are undermining people everywhere. The more we make concessions here, the more we don't do something on the environment, the more pressure it puts on everybody else to follow the U.S. And there's a lot of pressure. You know, Europe is pretty neoliberal right now. And it sees that as that's the only way we can compete with the United States. So, you know, there's actually... For all the other pressures there are, there's even more pressure on the working class in the United States because it's the center of the empire. You know, things are going to have to change here. They're going to change elsewhere. Uh, so, you know, for Canadians, it's critical. You know, we have to do what we can where we are. But we could never complete a different society unless there were changes in the United States. We never had this question. Okay. Cool.